It is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's loyal opposition. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, Speaker. Speaker, we're in big trouble here in Ontario. We now have 790 uh, patients uh, in ICUs in our province, 72 new admissions over the last 24 hours, 32 more people have lost their lives to COVID-19 in that time. Just, uh, just in this last day. And we know very clearly uh, what to do. I mean, the science table has set out uh, very clear and simple recommendations as to the measures that the government needs to be taking. And of course, one of those key recommendations uh, is paid sick days. So my question to the uh, Deputy Premier Speaker is, after a year of ignoring this advice to bring paid sick days to Ontario, the advice from the science table Question. and so many others. Is the government finally prepared to listen? Government House Leader, your uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. As uh, the Leader of the Opposition will know, of course, uh, uh, we moved very quickly on this uh, a number of months ago uh, with respect to a paid sick day. The Premier uh, negotiated a, a very comprehensive uh, agreement, uh, Mr. Speaker. We were, as I said uh, earlier in this House, uh, I believe it was Monday, we were uh, disappointed that, uh, uh, that uh, the federal budget did not include some of the enhancements that we had asked for, uh, Mr. Speaker, that uh, we were assured would be in that budget. Uh, uh, and given that those, uh, those enhancements that uh, we had advocated for, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, we have uh, been very clear that uh, the government of Ontario will be, uh, uh, will be uh, coming forward with uh, additional enhancements uh, uh, in the very, very near future. A supplementary question. Well, Speaker, we'll we'll see what tomorrow brings, but we know what the track record is of this Ford government. Uh, the two measly sick days that we had in Ontario were cancelled by this Ford government. One of the first things they did when they took office. Uh, we know that the government of uh, Canada proposed a national program, and here's what our premier said when that was announced: yep. "I don't support it." That's what Doug Ford said, or that's what the Premier said. I don't support it. He also said it's a waste of taxpayers' money to save people's lives with paid sick days. And then he accused folks who have been advocating for paid sick days for some time, including his own science table, that we were trying to confuse people about the need for paid sick days in our province. Speaker. Question. What has changed now? that the government finally acknowledges that paid sick days are exactly what Ontario workers need and deserve, when for the last year they've been saying it was the wrong thing. Obviously, Mr. Speaker, just the op opposite. That's why the Premier uh, uh, worked so hard to ensure that there was a very comprehensive uh, uh, on, uh, made in Ontario plan, a plan that was uh, quite frankly applauded by the leader of the NDP federally, somebody who used to sit in, uh, in this chamber. In fact, in, in a press release uh, many months ago, the, the uh, national leader of the NDP, uh, who the leader of the opposition spoke, who's conventionally the leader of the opposition recently spoke to, uh, made a great deal of hay out of the fact that he had negotiated a nationwide uh, sick benefit for all Canadian workers. Uh, look, Mr. Speaker, there have been certain changing circumstances. We've seen that variants uh, of concern are, uh, are, are, are troubling, Mr. Speaker. We're seeing tr uh, troubling circumstances at our, at our border. As the vaccine supply has not materialized as the way it should have, it is, it's very clear that we need to supplement uh, uh, the, the, the original plan that was negotiated by the, the Premier. Given that there's a $700 million surplus in that uh, program, given the failure of the federal government to move on it, we will be moving on it very quickly. The final supplementary. Speaker, entire families are in the ICUs of Ontario because of this government's inaction when it comes to paid sick days. We can't wait another week for the Premier to dilly-dally around doing the right thing for, our, for our, our workers in this province. We're over a year into this pandemic, Speaker. Workers have lost their lives. Young mothers are in ICUs with COVID-19, getting sick. Children have lost their parents, Speaker. This government can no longer ignore the science. It can no longer come forward with half measures and delays. When will the government bring forward a real, effective, paid sick day program for Ontario's workers? 
Again, Government House Speaker. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Obviously, uh, as, I, as I've just said, uh, uh, given the failure of the federal government to address uh, uh, the, the challenges, uh, the obstacles in the, in the, in the, um, uh, the current uh, uh, Canada Sickness Response Benefit, uh, the province of Ontario will be uh, moving to uh, supplement, uh, supplement that for Ontario workers. Look, we understand how important essential workers are to the province of Ontario, uh, Mr. Speaker, and not just the frontline workers in our health care system who have been extraordinary heroes throughout this, but yes, those workers who have kept the supply chain going, Mr. Speaker, when we go to our grocery stores and we see the cashiers, when we go to uh, the grocery stores and are able to buy things, it's because somebody is working somewhere to ensure that we have the ability to do that, Mr. Speaker. That is why we worked so hard with the federal government to ensure that there was an original uh, benefit for workers, Mr. Speaker. We thought, we have been explaining to the federal government Response. that given the lack of vaccines and given the shortage of vaccines, that that had to be supplemented, Mr. Speaker. I was very clear on, what, on the measures that we think needed to be taken, and the government of Ontario will be moving quickly uh, to make sure that that happens. The next question. Once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you so much, Speaker. My next question is also for the Deputy Premier. Speaker, yesterday I was joined by Dr. Danielle Raza uh, to talk about the need for paid sick days in our province, uh, and he was pleading, like so many others, pleading with the government for a true paid sick day program where workers don't lose any pay if they stay home sick. Working people don't take paid sick days if they think they're going to lose pay. So it's a matter of acting, but getting it right. My question to this government is, will they do exactly the right thing and make sure that no worker will lose pay by taking a paid sick day? They will be fully paid when they stay home sick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Of course, we moved uh, very quickly to protect workers in the province of Ontario with respect to protecting uh, their employment as uh, uh, the COVID-19 uh, uh, COVID uh, pandemic unfolded, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we did work very closely with the federal government for a number of months, Mr. Speaker, the, uh, where the federal government was to handle transfers to people and individuals in the province of Ontario would focus on health, long-term care, and, uh, and education. But as the uh, variants of controls, we've seen the, 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 the challenges that we're facing at the border, as the supply of vaccine failed to materialize in the way it, 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 it should have been, or the way we were told, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, and given the failure of the federal government to move on Monday, as we, assure, we were assured they would, uh, it, is, it is absolutely correct. We need to ensure that these essential workers who are so important, uh, not only to the economy, Response. but to ensuring that we can get through this pandemic, we need to ensure that they are taken care of, Mr. Speaker, and we will be moving on the exact same things that I mentioned in this House on Monday. Supplementary question. Last things, the, the last thing that sick and dying workers in this province need are empty platitudes from a government. It's too late for any of that. We see what's happening to the workers in this province because the Premier refused to act. What we need is a program for paid sick days that is easy for people uh, to, uh, uh, to, to see through, easy for people to take advantage of, where there are no barriers, where there are no requirements for doctor's notes, where there are no application forms required where there's no waiting for benefits. This is the kind of program that's necessary to actually help workers to stay well. In fact, my colleague from London West, Bill 239, does exactly those things. So will the government today commit Tim? to a barrier-free, accessible, say, paid sick days program like is outlined in Bill 239? Just vote for that bill and we'll be good. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Again, we will uh, uh, we will be uh, working very quickly to uh, to fill the gaps uh, that uh, the the Canada Sickness Response Benefit uh, uh, currently has, Mr. Speaker. We, as I said, we were assured that uh, those gaps would be filled. Uh, I, I too, like I, I know a number of members, was was disappointed to see in the federal government that budget on Monday that that didn't exist. I was even more surprised when they. Uh, uh, when they celebrated a $20 billion surplus in their pandemic response, Mr. Speaker. But having said that, the Leader of the Opposition is quite correct. Those essential workers who are working to keep this economy going, but more importantly, to help us get through this pandemic, workers like those at uh, 
at uh, Novo Plastics in, uh, in, uh, in the riding of Markham Unionville. These are people who are working very hard every single day. They're working at more than one job in many circumstances, Mr. Speaker. It is very difficult for them. They had a benefit that was there. It does not go far enough, Mr. Speaker, especially given the fact that we have not been able to vaccinate the supplies of vaccines in as quickly as we were told they would be in February. March, April, and now heading into May, Mr. Speaker, the Government of Ontario is going to move quickly to fill the gaps that the federal government left behind, Mr. Speaker, and that is coming very shortly. The final supplementary. Speaker, we all know that doctors and nurses and experts, the government's own science table, has been pleading with this Ford government for over a year to do the right thing when it comes to working people in this province. The stakes could not be higher, as we all know. The ICUs are bursting at the seams. Work, working uh, frontline healthcare workers are they're, working off their feet. They are stressed. They are fearful going into work every day to see what might be facing them at every shift. The government needs to do the right thing. They need to bring in paid sick days, and they need to bring in a program that works for working people. The NDP has a motion today on the order paper that is supposed to be de uh, debated. And it calls for paid sick time off. It calls for paid vac vaccination time off. Will the government Question. do the right thing? Stop trying to get rid of that uh, NDP Opposition Day motion. Debate that motion with us and then support us and start working to save workers' lives. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I do uh, appreciate the question from the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, look, the Leader of the Opposition herself just refused unanimous consent to have uh, the, the legislative session uh, today go through uh, till midnight. On the order paper, I know she's very upset about this, but on the order paper are two very brief motions which will not take away from the Opposition Day timing with respect to night sittings going forward to the end of the session. I think it's very important, Mr. Speaker. With respect to the Opposition Day motion on the order paper, I can tell uh, very clearly the, the Leader of the opposition. We will not be supporting that motion because it is vague. It, it does not provide enough specifics. And, and as the Leader of the op Opposition just said, we have to provide the people of the province of Ontario, the essential workers in the province of Ontario who have been Order. working so hard to keep this economy going, but more importantly, to help us get through this pandemic, we need to give them real measures, Mr. Speaker, in, uh, in light of the fact that the federal budget has accomplished that. We will, Mr. Speaker. No half measures, Mr. Speaker. That's why we will not be supporting that motion. And I look forward to the fulsome debate on it this afternoon. Order. The next question, the member for Brampton Centre. Thank you and good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. The science table is clear that non-essential workplaces must be shut down to save lives and save workers from contracting COVID-19. Yesterday, uh, a group of 40 doctors, medical professionals, and scientists released an open letter, and I'll quote, Ontario is now facing the most challenging health crisis of our time. Our case counts are at all-time highs, and our hospitals are bucking. Younger people are getting sicker. This disease is ripping through entire families, end quote. But, Speaker, the government is still not listening to these experts. In Peel, Chief Medical Officer Dr. Lowe had to take steps to protect workers because this government clearly won't. Dr. Davila in Toronto echoed similar sentiments. Speaker, Dr. Lowe has said that in the absence of paid sick days, he was left with no other choice, and that's why he issued an order to close any workplaces with outbreaks of five or more cases. Why Question. is the Premier refusing? to protect workers in Brampton and Mississauga like the science table their own science table is recommending. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Just to be clear, uh, these are, uh, of course, uh, authorities that the Chief Medical Officer of Health Appeal in Toronto have had uh, throughout uh, throughout this pandemic. Uh, these are not new uh, uh, new measures. In fact, as I said, they've they've had these authorities uh, uh, throughout, uh, Mr. Speaker. We have, of course, uh, done a number of measures to address uh, a hotspot and essential workplaces, even given the fact that the the vaccines have not materialized as we were promised they would in February, March, April, and now heading into May, Mr. Speaker. We've moved. 
uh, uh, vaccines so that we can go directly into hotspot communities, Mr. Speaker. We've gone into these essential workplaces so that we can ensure that uh, we are getting vaccines to them uh, quicker, Mr. Speaker, because I think ultimately that's what the workers in, 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 in the, the, the essential workplaces that I've talked to, they want. They want to be working, Mr. Speaker, and the way that we can ensure that they are working is Response? by getting vaccines in their arm, Mr. Speaker, but in the absence of that, we have to protect those workers. In the absence of federal leadership, on this. The province of Ontario will fill the gaps that we were assured would be closed on Monday. They weren't, and we will take action to ensure that they are. The supplementary question. Speaker, what workers want in the province of Ontario is paid sick days and actually to be protected by this government, but they continue to ignore those pleas. And the science table has made it abundantly clear yesterday. They wrote, the list of what stays open must be as short as possible, end quote. We know from Dr. Lowe's orders that workplaces in Brampton and the rest of Peel continue to be unsafe, but this government hasn't enforced additional safety measures in any of those workplaces. They haven't provided paid sick days or prioritized workers in these warehouses and workplaces for their vaccines, Speaker. And as a result of this, people are risking their lives getting COVID-19 and spreading this to their families. This is putting our ICUs in distress. What does this government not understand about this, Speaker? My question is simple. Has the government calculated the cost of providing paid sick days to workers versus the cost of their inaction and the cost to our health care system and economy? Thank you. Government House Leader. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. As I just said, uh, Mr. Speaker, we have made significant movements with respect to ensuring that our essential workers could be safe. That is why the Premier negotiated uh, an initial, uh, uh, the initial Canada uh, sickness response benefit, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. We were assured that on Monday that that would uh, be supplemented to fill in some of the gaps that we had, especially in light of the fact that the vaccines did not arrive in February. March, April, and now probably heading into May, Mr. Speaker, despite the fact that our international borders were causing us uh, tremendous difficulties. But the member is right. We have to do more to protect essential workers, and that's what we are doing. We're transitioning to ensure that, uh, uh, that uh, essential workplaces uh, are, are vaccinated. We're ensuring that hotspots uh, uh, are vaccinated. Despite the lack of supply from the federal government, there's almost, uh, if I'm not mistaken, four million uh, uh, close to four million uh, Ontarians have been have received their first Fox? vaccination, Mr. Speaker. We're getting the job done. More has to happen. It's unfortunate that that didn't happen in Monday's budget, as we were assured it would. But we will move quickly to ensure that all essential workers, Mr. Speaker, who are so important to getting past this pandemic, are protected. Okay. The next question, the member for Peterborough, Kortha. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We're in the middle of a dangerous third wave of COVID-19, a wave largely caused by variants of concern brought here from other countries. Yesterday, in India alone, more than 300,000 daily new cases were reported and 2,000 deaths, a third of yesterday's global case counts. While it's not yet confirmed by public health, authorities, the evidence, believed, the evidence seems to suggest that the new double mutant variant B1.617 may be more virulent, more transmissible, and may be responsible for India's overwhelming second wave. Mr. Speaker, it's really very simple. We need to close our borders to stop the variants from getting in. Will this government call on the federal government to secure our international borders immediately? Government House Leader. Uh, thank you very uh, thank you very much mr speaker and and the members right let me first uh, let me first say this our order uh, uh, we have uh we have really enjoyed a, a wonderful relationship uh, with the people of India, so our hearts go out to them. We understand how difficult uh, this, is, uh, this is, is for them. They have been incredible partners for us, Mr. Speaker. I've heard from a number of my constituents Order. who have uh, family back in India who are very concerned, Mr. Speaker, uh, on this. But ultimately, I can't exactly hear what's being said by the opposition, but I would caution you um, and, and please stop heckling. Government House Leader, reply. Mr. Speaker, what we're calling on is that the federal government do a better job of securing our borders. This is very, very important, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we have seen variants of concern coming from other international jurisdictions into, uh, into the province of Ontario, into Canada, and the federal government has to do a better job of helping us secure these borders. Hundreds of people are coming in, landing every Once. single day. 
uh, uh, bringing in more variants of concern, and we have to get a handle on this. So I say very clearly to the Prime Minister, please close down our international borders. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In the last two weeks, there have been at least 17 flights from India to Toronto with confirmed COVID positive cases. On these 17 flights, more than 260 rows of passengers were, were deemed as affected by the confirmed cases. Mr. Speaker, this could represent literally thousands of possible exposures. The right thing to do is to secure the borders, and only the federal government can do that. Will this government insist that the federal government act now before it is too late? Uh, uh, yes, Mr. Speaker. Again, it's a, it's a very, very good question. Uh, uh, it is very important. It is essential, Mr. Speaker, that the Prime Minister heed the words of those provinces that have uh, still have international flights coming in, uh, Mr. Speaker. It is time that we get control of the borders. And I'm, I'm, I'm pleading with the Prime Minister. I'm pleading with the Prime Minister that he take action to secure our borders. Uh, these variants of concerns that are coming from international jurisdictions are having a dramatic impact on places like Ontario, uh, uh, British Columbia, uh, Alberta, uh, uh, Quebec, Mr. Speaker, and we have to do all that we can to secure our borders, borders to stop this from happening. And it's not only about importing uh, uh, variants of concern, it's about exporting it as well. It's about Canadians going to other jurisdictions and people coming to this country, Mr. Speaker. This is an enormous problem uh, in Canada right now, and I am pleading. I am pleading with the Prime Minister to secure our borders so that we can get control of these international variants. We saw what has happened with the Brazilian uh, variant. We saw what happened with the UK variant. Spons? We saw what happened uh, with the South African variant, Mr. Speaker. He needs to take control of those borders so that we can get control of this pandemic here in the province of Ontario and across Canada. Thank you. The next question, the member for Algoma, Manitoulin. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Premier. Uh, this question is about government ethics and priorities. The Premier managed to shock Ontarians once again by planning a political fundraiser with tickets costing $1,000 per person in the middle of a disastrous third wave. This week's fundraiser has now been postponed, but over the last week, the Premier has held a slew of cash for access fundraisers and charging thousands for a chance to meet the Premier. While our hospitals are overrun with COVID patients in ICUs, why is this Premier meeting with donors instead of the doctors and experts who can get us through this crisis? In fact, Mr. Speaker, that is what not only the Premier, but I would certainly hope all members of this legislature have been doing, meeting with officials in their ridings, meeting with constituents in their ridings. I know that I have been doing that on a, on a, on a daily basis, Mr. Speaker, and I would hope that all members, in fact, I know that all members have been doing that. Uh, uh, this Premier has been working full, nonstop. Uh, since well before the pandemic to put the province of Ontario back on the right track. We inherited a devastating situation, whether it was out-of-control budgets, whether it was a, a health care system that hadn't received proper investments in over a decade, Mr. Speaker, long-term care that was a mess, transit and transportation systems that were outdated and needed renewal, Mr. Speaker, and this Premier got to work right away. And when the pandemic hit, Mr. Speaker, this Premier moved into action right away. And it wasn't just this Premier. It was all of the colleagues on this side of the House Response. and to the great credit of all members of this Legislature. We all worked together to help defeat this pandemic, Mr. Speaker. There is a light at the end of the tunnel, and if we continue to work together, we will get past this. A supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Again, to the Deputy Premier, this question is about the priorities of this Premier and this government. The essential workers this government calls heroes could never afford to afford these exclusive fundraisers. But those are the people the government needs to hear right now. Last Thursday's fundraiser happened at the same time Cabinet was supposed to be meeting to plan a response to COVID crisis. In the middle of an unprecedented crisis, Will this government finally focus on the issues that matter to all Ontarians? And that is what we have continued to do, Mr. Speaker, right from the beginning. 
Uh, now, I note that the Leader of the Opposition actually spoke to the NDP National Convention uh, last week or the week before, and I would have hoped that she would have brought a message to her former caucus colleague uh, and uh, now the Leader of the, uh, of the NDP in Ottawa the message that we needed the federal government to live up to its commitment to improve the Canada Sickness Response Benefit. But that's not the message the Leader of the Official Opposition took to a partisan convention, Mr. Speaker. Instead, I will ask her this, point blank, will she call her national leader and suggest to him that he vote against the federal budget, a federal budget that had $20 billion in unspent pandemic response, a federal budget that did not improve the Canada Sickness Response Benefit Order. the way we were hoping, Mr. Speaker. Will the Leader of Opposition, will all of the members of the NDP stand in their place Order. and ask their federal response. leader to vote against that federal budget, Mr. Speaker, because it didn't meet the needs of the people of the province of Ontario? Order. The next question, the member for Cambridge. Mr. Speaker, good morning. My question is for the Solicitor General. Last Friday, this government tried to turn Ontario's police forces into its own political enforcement service by stating that officers can now randomly ask pedestrians and motorists for their identification and why they aren't at home. We were then led to believe that the government, quote unquote, walked back these regulations, as the Solicitor General publicly stated that the new regulation would add a belief requirement. Unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, upon reading the regulation, Order. there is no belief requirement imposed on an officer, and this government didn't walk back anything. In fact, the rewritten regulation is now even worse. Will the Solicitor General admit that she didn't properly explain the rewritten regulation and confirm that the new regulation has tossed away one's right to remain silent by compelling them to give the police information and allowed the police to question people based not on a belief, Question. but on a suspicion that someone is attending an outdoor gathering. To reply, the Solicitor General. Thank you, Speaker. You know, as I've said continuously, it is critical for all Ontarians to respect the stay-at-home order, to prevent people getting COVID. We need to stop the spread. And although the vast majority of Ontarians have respected public health measures put in place, individuals continue to put others at risk by gathering with those outside of their household. Our priority has always been to address and discourage gatherings and crowds that violate the stay-at-home order. And we have the potential to do this right and stop the spread of COVID-19, give our ICU capacity the space they need to protect people across Ontario. Thank you. Thank you. The supplementary question. Now, Mr. Speaker, last year I encouraged the Solicitor General to read Bill 195, and now I'm encouraging her to read her own regulations that clearly state reason to suspect, and an officer may require an individual to provide information. With those two lines, this government has turned the police into judge and jury, and it didn't take long to see the results. Reports appeared from Gravenhurst of a boy being taken to the ground by officers because he failed to identify and because the officer said, you don't talk to an adult like this. Mr. Speaker, if being rude was a crime, at least half of the Ontario PC Party establishment would be in jail. But being rude is not supposed to be a crime in Ontario. Does the Solicitor General see that the language in her regulation that says individuals have to provide information and no longer have the right to remain silent can lead to physical clashes between officers and individuals who aren't doing anything wrong, like we saw in Gravenhurst? Solicitor General. Thank you. So we have reinforced and refocused Ontario Reg 8-21, the enforcement of the COVID-19 measures. If a police officer or other provincial offence officer has reason to suspect that you are participating in an organized public event or social gathering, they may require you to provide information to ensure you are complying with the restrictions. As I have said repeatedly, this is all about ensuring that people only go out when it is absolutely necessary to ensure that we limit the spread of COVID-19 and protect our intensive care bed capacity. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Peterborough Court. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just last week, the Medical Officer of Health in my region confirmed that we are the highest percentage of uh, variants of concern in our region. Yesterday, Prime Minister Trudeau was asked by the media why the borders are still open to jurisdictions, international jurisdictions, with high rates of COVID-19 cases and new and emerging variants of concern. The Prime Minister said the officials would, quote, look at what the UK has done, suspending flights from other jurisdictions, and what more can be done and should be done 
to ensure we're not getting cases from overseas. The Prime Minister suggests there's a lot of, to look into here and that there is a lot to study. Mr. Speaker, while the, federal, while the federal government looks into this, perhaps this government can tell us exactly what needs to be done to ensure that Question. we aren't bringing in variants of concern from outside of Ontario. And I will say to the honourable gentleman, it's, it, it is a very, good, it's a very good question, but it's also, it is also about us exporting as well. So we will again. Let me reiterate to the people of the province of Ontario and Canadians in general, uh, as much as uh, we have seen an influx and we are seeing daily an influx of other jurisdictions and variants of, uh, of concern, uh, international variants of concern into the province of Ontario. Uh, it is also very important that we do our job not to export. Uh, COVID to other jurisdictions, Mr. Speaker. Look, we we have led the way with respect to the province of Ontario with respecting at our international airports. Uh, we've asked the federal government to do that. Isolation centers, we asked the federal government to do that, Mr. Speaker. But when you're looking at those variants of concerns, other jurisdictions have moved more quickly to restrict access uh, to their countries, Mr. Speaker. We have to get control of our international airports, in particular, Mr. Speaker, in our, in our border crossings. These variants of concern are very, very troubling, and when combined with the lack of supply that we're seeing on vaccines over the next uh, over the next uh, number of weeks, Mr. Speaker, it is very important. And I plead with the Prime Minister: take action on uh, on our international borders soon. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And this is a very serious situation. We have thousands of flights each month, and tens of thousands of people flying into this country, potentially with exposures to COVID-19. At the outset of this pandemic, Canada closed its borders. Other jurisdictions have done the same. We could look to Taiwan, New Zealand, Australia, for example. Mr. Speaker, when will Canada take action? Will this government do everything in its power to call on the federal government to secure our borders and protect Canadians? From the dangerous new variants of COVID-19. Again, the government has to do. Yeah, and, and again, we uh, uh, the, the member is, is correct, and and look, we. We, we hold our hands out to the federal government. We want to work with you on this the way we did with testing at, uh, at Pearson Airport. It was, of course, this government uh, uh, that started uh, testing of international travellers at Pearson Airport. Uh, uh, a number of weeks later, the federal government did help us help out on that, Mr. Speaker. It was this government that led the way on isolation uh, centres for those international travellers who were coming into the country and needed to, to isolate because they were bringing in uh, uh, those who had brought in COVID, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. We want to work with the federal government to ensure that our borders are secure. These variants of concerns, these international variants of concerns, are causing a dramatic impact on our ability to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic, Mr. Speaker. It's not just about those who come here, but it's also about Canadians exporting uh, to other uh, other countries. Response. Uh, so I plead with the Prime Minister work with us to secure our international borders so that we can put all the necessary resources that we need to into ensuring that the people of the province of Ontario and the people of Canada are safe. The next question, the member for Hamilton West, and Castor Dundas. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the L9K area in my riding of Hamilton West and Castor Dundas is currently dealing with an alarming outbreak of cases and positivity rates. But because the Premier and the Conservative chose their own political fortunes, over the people of Hamilton, we still can't get our fair share of vaccines or the extra support we need to keep people safe. So, Speaker, Speaker my question this morning is to the Deputy Premier. This week, we learned the Auditor General is now looking into the PC Party's politicization of postal codes. My question, when will you stop playing politics and start listening to the experts who are begging you to do your job and keep people safe? Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. And I would say to the member opposite through you, Speaker, that I absolutely disagree with the elements of your statement. This, the hotspots were identified uh, initially 
by the science advisory table, working with the information that was available through Public Health Ontario. They were then reviewed, taking into consideration other elements, such as hospitalizations in that area, ICU admissions, fatalities, issues with respect to language, socioeconomic factors, uh, vaccine hesitancy, a number of additional factors were brought into that decision, which was then brought before the vaccine uh, task force, was accepted by the task force, and that is the basis upon which we are doing the vaccinations and making sure that 25 per cent from the top of all vaccinations before Response. they're allocated equitably among all of the 34 public health unit regions based on population is making sure that they have those extra vaccines in those hotspots to halt transmission in those areas, which will help all of Ontario. Supplementary question. I appreciate the answer, but I think we'll be interested to see what the Auditor General actually has to say about this issue. And Mr. Speaker, every day I hear from frontline workers, teachers, childcare workers, grocery store clerks, hundreds of people who, despite putting their lives on the line every day, still can't get a vaccine. And Mr. Speaker, you will know the science table has been clear. They said so again yesterday. We need to get more vaccines and more supports into hotspot areas. And we need to ensure that those at the highest risk, the highest risk of catching COVID are being protected. That means vaccinating frontline workers. So again, my question through you, Mr. Speaker, and to the Deputy Premier, will you listen to the science table this time, or are you going to pretend that you know better? Minister Health. Thank you, Speaker. Since the beginning of this pandemic, we have been listening to the advice of the medical experts and taking their advice. The entire vaccination rollout plan was designed with the assistance of the medical advisors with a bioethics table to advise that we need to ba uh, vaccinate based on age and at risk and concentrate in the vaccine hotspots. That is exactly what we are doing. That is why we have designated the top 25 per cent of vaccines to go to those public health units where they're having particular difficulty. And I would specif specifically mention Peel in Toronto, where a lot of the hotspots exist right now. But the issue is supply of vaccine. We are being supplied with vaccines, as the member will know, by the federal government. We had delays in vaccines through part of February into early March. We're receiving more vaccines from Pfizer now. The AstraZeneca, we will be receiving more. Moderna has Response. been delayed three times and the supply has been cut in half. But I can advise that as of yesterday, we were able to administer 136,000 353 vaccines. So we are. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Ottawa, Vanier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Solicitor General. Last Friday, I think we can all say that there was a collective shock and frustration felt across the province over the proposal of sweeping and dangerous police powers. So much so that even regional police services spoke out against these enforcement measures. Then on Monday, Many essential workers commuting from Gatineau to Ottawa found themselves caught in hours-long traffic jams while Ottawa police were stretched in trying to monitor seven crossing points. It seems like there was absolutely no coordination or consultation done ahead of Friday's announcement, resulting in confusion and frustration for so many people across the province. So did the Solicitor General and the government consult with any of our municipalities and regional police services before their announcement of outrageous Question. policing policies. To reply, the Solicitor General. Thank you, Speaker. So as I've mentioned, the COVID-19 variants of concern continue to pose a significant threat to Ontario citizens, and those variants come to Ontario from other jurisdictions. That's why our government issued an emergency order restricting travel into Ontario through land and water, crossings from the province of Manitoba and Quebec, while continuing to advocate for the federal government to restrict travel from federally regulated aviation. You know, and I think it's important to note that the uh, province of Quebec has instituted a similar travel ban into their jurisdiction. Local police services are best positioned to determine the operational deployments necessary to ensure the continued safety within their communities. Thank you. Supplementary question. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again to the Solicitor General. Mr. Speaker, racialized and low-income Ontarians have already shouldered a disproportionate share of the pandemic's negative impacts. The science table gave clear recommendations and advice. Close all but essential workplaces. Have paid sick leave. Vaccinate essential workers. Allow safe outdoor activities two metres apart. And do not further arm racialized and marginalized people. So how could the Solicitor General possibly think that increasing police control is what this province needs? Government House Leader. In fact, there are a number of measures that uh, the province of Ontario has taken to ensure the safety and security of the people of the province of Ontario, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, the first thing, uh, what uh, I, I would suggest to the, the member opposite, and I think she would probably agree with me, the first thing that we need to do is to ensure that we have a proper supply of vaccines that we can get into the people, uh, into the arms of the people of the province of Ontario, despite the fact that we've seen reduced shipments in February. March, April, and heading into May, uh, we have gotten four million vaccines into people's uh, into people's arms, Mr. Speaker. But there's still so so much more work uh, more work to be done. I would ask the member opposite if she could work with us, uh, work with us to uh, to reach out to the federal government to ensure that we can get some control of our borders. Work with us so that we can get control of our international board international borders, where these international variants of concern have become so difficult in helping us uh, beat the pandemic here in the province Response. of Ontario and across Canada. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Peterborough Fortha. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Many jurisdictions are struggling with the possibility of more transmissible and more virulent variations of COVID-19, like B117 first discovered in the UK, or B1.427 first discovered in California, or B1 1617 that I've already spoken about. In the last two weeks, we've seen at least 17 international flights with confirmed cases of COVID-19. On those 17 flights, we can estimate possibly 2,500 passengers are at risk of exposure to the virus. Mr. Speaker, if the federal government is not willing to secure our borders, and ban flights from hotspots. What can we do to keep these dangerous Question. new variants from entering the country? The government house leader. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And it really is an important question that the member opposite raises, and, and I can't say it enough. We are pleading to the Prime Minister of Canada to do his part, help us secure our international borders and ban flights from hotspots. It is so important, Mr. Speaker. Order. We are seeing hundreds of flights come into Pearson Airport every single week with hundreds of variants of, uh, of concern, Mr. Speaker. This Order. cannot continue. We need the help of the federal government to do this. It's not enough that we instituted a, a, a testing program at Pearson Airport, unilaterally the province of Ontario. It's not enough that we uh, instituted isolation, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, for those travelers with COVID. We need the help of the prime minister and the federal government. Only they can stop traveling between Response. Canada and those jurisdictions with variants of control, uh, control that are out of control, Mr. Speaker. Please help us and get control of those international borders. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I believe the minister is quite right. The only way to stop the variants from entering the country are banning flights from those hotspots. Countries across the world are tightening their borders. You just have to look at Taiwan at New Zealand, at Australia. And meanwhile, Canada is accepting travelers from everywhere on more than 120 international flights in just the last few weeks. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister has acknowledged the effectiveness of border closures earlier last year. And he said, from the beginning, we brought in some of the toughest and most stringent travel restrictions of any of our peer countries around the world. Mr. Speaker, Perhaps the government can shed some light on, if these measures were effective a year ago, where are they today? Order. Good question. Government House Leader. Well, yes, Mr. Speaker, and, and, and frankly, it is, it is shocking to see that the opposition in this place 
is not supportive of measures that would keep the people of the province of Ontario and, frankly, the people across Canada safe, Mr. Speaker. It is not just about us protecting our borders from international travellers who bring in these variants of concern, whether it was the UK variant, whether it was the Brazilian, uh, Brazilian variant, whether it was the South African uh, variant, Mr. Speaker. We are in the midst of a third wave that started outside of our borders, Mr. Speaker. We need to do more to protect our international borders and our international airports. I am pleading with the Prime Minister. I am pleading with the Prime Minister to help us. It is not enough simply to do testing, Mr. Speaker. It is not enough to do isolation, Mr. Speaker. We need to control our borders and stop flights from these international hotspots, Mr. Speaker, if we are Response. to get control. So I directly to the Prime Minister of Canada, help the people of the province of Ontario close our international borders to hotspots. We're very Thank you. The next question, the member for Ottawa Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. As many people have already raised this morning, Speaker, our ICUs are near the breaking point. We're getting close to 100 patients now being treated in our ICUs. But despite this fact, the government has refused to make public its plans for critical care triage in those ICUs. We don't know. People with disabilities and their loved ones and advocacy organizations, still, we don't know what has been negotiated in secret and what actually will happen when those life and death decisions take place. But Speaker at home, Dr. David Neely-Povitz, the ICU director at the Ottawa Hospital, told CBC News, quote, it would be naive for us to think that triage or changes in the standard of care have not already come about. Let's think about that. Yesterday, the minister rose in this house and said, there is no clinical triage protocol, but we know, Speaker, that hospitals have received one on January 13th. And we also know that a training was done for medical professionals on YouTube on the 23rd of January. So, Speaker, I Question. want to ask the, the minister, who is very well versed in these issues, what instructions have been sent out and drafted to emergency medical technicians or ambulance services or health professionals about who will live and who will die in our ICUs? Thank you very much, Speaker. And I can certainly advise the member that no triage protocol has been activated or approved by the government of Ontario. There have been discussions. I understand that there were a number of uh, disability groups that were concerned with respect to a previous draft that was uh, uh, prepared in earlier this year. That was then reviewed with the Human Rights Commission. There have been a number of discussions about modifications to it, but nothing has been activated, nothing has been approved by this government. What we are doing instead is to create the capacity so that we can care for all the patients that come into our hospital, whether they're COVID patients or emergency patients that come in otherwise. We have created over 3,100 beds since this pandemic began, increased our intensive care capacity by 14 per cent. We are looking at bringing Response. in other health professionals from other provinces and other countries so that notwithstanding having the creation of those spaces, we will also have the health human resources in order to be able to operate them safely, carefully and professionally. The supplementary question. Speaker, earlier today I was joined by disability rights leaders for a media conference, all of whom are calling upon this government to make public its plans for critical care triage. Speaker, I know this minister served as patient ombudsperson for this province for years and knows full well that every patient, physiotypical, neurotypical or not, has a right to their care at the point of service. But the minister also should know that hospitals got a critical triage protocol on January 13th, that a training has been conducted so I must admit, Speaker, my extreme frustration that today, when our ICUs are nearing capacity, we are still hearing there are no plans. Speaker, let me say very clearly for this House, I didn't know at this point, not an acceptable answer. I was just following orders at this point, not an acceptable answer. Please forgive me to disabled patients and their loved ones, not an acceptable answer. Question. Will you make sure? that people with disabilities are not discriminated against in the ICUs, yes or no. Again, last member to make your comments to the chair, Minister of Health, to apply. Thank you very much, Speaker. 
the rights of people with disabilities has been one of my strongest passions since I got to this place 15 years ago. And I don't need to take any instructions from anybody, including the leader of the official opposition, about this issue. I have Order. always stood up for Order. the rights of people with disabilities. Order. Opposition come to order. Member for Northumberland, Peterborough South, come to order. Minister of Health, please reply. The rights of people with, dis rights of people with disabilities have been one of the uh, issues that we have cared about and dealt with as part of this entire pandemic. The rights of people with disabilities are equally as important as the rights of anybody else. That is something that I've always stood by that I always will stand by. And I can assure the member opposite that no triage protocol has been approved. A draft was circulated in January. That was not approved by this government. It was something Response. that had been discussed, but I understand that the rights Order. of people with disabilities have been brought Order. forward. I asked them. Member for Ottawa Centre, come to order. Member for Hamilton West, Ancaster Dundas, come to order. Will the minister please conclude her response. I asked that this issue be dealt with with the right, people with disabilities groups, as well as with the Ontario Human Rights Commission. There have been numerous discussions, but nothing has been activated yet, and I can assure you nothing has been approved at this point. We are working to make sure— Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Ottawa South. Thank you very uh, much, Mr. Speaker. My questions for the Deputy Premier. Yesterday, the COVID science table released a roadmap of what Ontario needs to do to get a third wave under control and to help us safely reopen. The report highlights all of the public health measures the science table has been asking for for months and what the government has failed to implement. Reduce the list of essential workplaces, reinstate paid sick days, prioritize vaccinating essential workers and hotspot neighbourhoods, encourage people to get outdoors and have activity, not carding, shuttering playgrounds, or $1,000 ticket fundraisers. Speaker, it's a roadmap. It's a prescription for success. So through you, will the Premier stop ignoring the science and take the advice of the COVID-19 science table so we can end this third wave nightmare? Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, since the onset of this pandemic, our government has relied on the advice and recommendations of our Chief Medical Officer of Health to inform our response. We have also been advised by a number of independent groups and organizations, including the Ontario uh, COVID-19 Science Advisory Table. They have provided us with critical data, with modeling and with feedback, which has been continuously incorporated into our plans to fight this pandemic. One key difference between wave one and wave three of this pandemic is the increased mobility of people. Uh, this compared, compared with the contagious variants has created the, uh, the, uh, this, the response and one of the greatest determinants of spread is how much people move around. The reducing the mobility is something that has been recommended by the science table. That is we have, what we have brought into our plan, and we've learned from other jurisdictions, such as Australia, that limitations Response. on mobility work to control the pan pandemic. That's what we are working on. That's what the uh, plan is going forward uh, that we have relied upon, including from the uh, scientific advisors on the science advisory table. The supplementary question. Speaker, throughout this pandemic, the Premier has been slow to act and quick to lay blame. Today there are 790 people in ICUs. Most of them are essential workers. This government took away two paid sick days in 2018. Imagine if those two paid sick days had been here for Ontarians at the beginning of this pandemic. They need more, but imagine less sickness, less hospitalizations, less longer effects of long-term effects of COVID, fewer people dying. Science Table has been asking for it for months, just about everybody in Ontario. It is incredible to me this government hasn't moved, and now they're saying we're going to fill the gap, a gap they created and until yesterday refused to acknowledge. Refused. Incredible. Okay. And now they're going to pat themselves on the back like they do every time they come in late. So, Speaker, 
through you. Will the Premier take the advice of the COVID-19 science table and reinstate paid sick days in Ontario today? Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, I certainly won't uh, take the advice of the member opposite and reinstate two paid sick days that the Liberals are advocating for. Obviously not, Mr. Speaker. We've said right from the beginning. Uh, when the NDP were asking for 14 and now the Liberals are asking for two, we said that we had to have 20 paid sick days for the people of the province of Ontario. That's what we fought for, Mr. Speaker, and that's what we, we got. We know that the federal government has been responsible for transfers to people while the province is focused on health, long-term care, uh, and education, Mr. Speaker. We were given assurances that that would be changing on Monday. When it didn't happen, Mr. Speaker, we have been very clear. We will move quickly to ensure that essential workers are taken care of. But what this member could have done, as he sat in the government for 15 years, is ensure that Ontario didn't have the lowest ICU cap capacity per capita in Order. North America, Mr. Speaker. He could have built more than 400 long-term care beds, Mr. Speaker. He could have made sure that we had the health Response. and human resources that are needed for long-term care beds. He could have stopped cutting health care, Mr. Speaker. He could have stopped uh, attacking education. He could have done more on transit and transportation. They Order. Next question. Member for London Fanshawe. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Speaker, this government's choice to put politics over people and their safety is putting lives at risk in London. Plain and simple, London's N6A postal code is dealing with one of the biggest COVID outbreaks in the province right now. But instead of stepping up with the help we need, the government is ignoring their own science table and refusing to declare us as a hotspot, denying lenders essential life-saving supports. Mm -hmm. Speaker, my question through you to the Minister of Health. Why are you choosing to ignore the advice of health experts when you know doing so is putting Londoners' lives at risk? Minister of Health. In fact, we have been informed by the medical experts about the initial uh, designation of the 114 hotspots. Uh, that is why, and, and we are prioritizing those hotspots to receive extra doses of vaccines, 25% uh, off the top, because we know that if we can get the uh, transmission in the hotspots under control, get more people vaccinated, that's for the benefit of people across the province. Now we know that there are other hotspots that are currently being declared. We are distributing extra doses as well from the uh, allocation that are coming forward. We know that the original hotspots aren't always going to be the only hotspots, so there are other ones coming forward, and we are prioritizing those areas and giving them extra allocations of vaccines as well, as we will do with London. A supplementary question. Speaker, uh, the Middlesex Unit uh, Health Unit's Dr. Mackey just said this week that, or excuse me, over the weekend, that our vaccines are being cut by 25%. Uh, to fund some GTA hotspots. And he also said, but our rates here in London and Middlesex have actually caught up. So we are a hotspot. We're just not recognized. So to make matters worse, to, on top of refusing to declare us as a hotspot, the Conservatives are now actually scaling down the amount of the va vaccines that Londoners will get. That decision just isn't reckless, Speaker. It's heartless. And it goes against every piece of advice doctors and scientists have been giving this government for months. Speaker, again through you to the minister. Every day you wait to act means more Londoners in ICU, more stress on our hospitals and families, and even potentials, more lives are lost. Will you reverse this decision and finally ensure that London hotspots get the support they so desperately need? Minister Health. Thank you very much, Speaker. Well, in actual fact, the uh, change in the allocation of vaccine doses was recommended um, by experts at the science advisory table, do doing some modelling to determine what that would mean in terms of reduction in hospitalizations, in ICU admissions, and in preventing deaths. That is why we have made that change. That is what the uh, medical experts have advised us to do, because that will have benefit not just for the people in those hotspots and those areas. It will benefit the entire province because it will stop the spread from those hotspots, which we know is going into other areas of the province. This is we've been advised by the medical experts that this is the best way to reduce transmission and to reduce the hospital numbers overall. Member for Scarborough Guildwood. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Premier. 
You know, last week when you announced that 25% more vaccines would go to hotspots, I, I really was excited about that. I thought finally Scarborough is going to get the help that it needs. But instead, the opposite has happened. Scarborough has received nothing. In fact, not only has the two hospital clinics closed, cancelling 10,000 appointments, today three additional community health centre clinics like Taibu and the SHSC, the Scarborough Centre for Healthy Communities, has also closed. So the people of Scarborough, when they thought they were getting the help and the support from this government that they need to save lives, are not receiving that. They are not receiving those vaccines. Those resources are now sitting idle. So my question, question. to the Deputy Premier, will you give Scarborough the priority vaccines that it needs instead of letting its resources sit idle? Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. Well, the answer is yes. We are giving Scarborough the priority resources it needs. It depends on when the supply comes in. When the supply comes in, then we have the resources to be able to do that. We expect the Pfizer vaccines to come in. We know the Moderna vaccines are coming in very shortly, and as well, we will be receiving more AstraZeneca. But what is happening? There's two different situations happening here. One with respect to those clinics is there's the allocation that is granted to the Toronto Public Health Unit. Toronto Public Health Unit then distributes the vaccines among the providers that are coming forward. When the providers run out of vaccines, that is, they can ask the Toronto Public Health Unit for more resources, but that is the allocation that they've received. The 25 per cent is going to be granted to uh, particularly in Scarborough, because Scarborough has 15 of the hot spots. But I can also advise that just due to a, a recent agreement that was made with Shoppers Drug Mart, they are going to be operating 24-7 in pharmacies in 20 locations across the province of Ontario, five of which five of which are going to be in Scarborough. So Scarborough is going to be receiving extra vaccines and extra times and extra locations for receipt of them. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning. There being no further business, this House stands in recess until 3 p.m.